morning, everyone. Psalm 146 starts out, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. We're going to ask you to stand now. We begin to worship. Lord, we ask you to come and fill this place with your spirit this morning and lead us in worship as we worship to you. In Jesus' name.
are my righteousness. the Hibbing Alliance Church. So glad that you're here. We are here to prayerfully build relationships so that we can impact lives with the transforming power of Jesus Christ and for the growth of God's kingdom. And that's what we should be about not only during Sunday morning, but all through every day of our life. Just a couple of announcements I'm going to share with you. One is not in your bulletin, so I want you, and if you're on the email and you read it, this is repeat, but I still want to make sure you get knowledge of this, okay? Alpha, uh, Minnesota, is trying to pull together a training for people who are doing Alpha in their churches. And we have discovered for many, many years that Alpha has been one of the primary tools that we've been able to use to introduce Christ to people that maybe not otherwise would be open to it. And so that training is very important for us. And so what they contacted Marsha, our Alpha coordinator, and said, we're trying to figure out how, what kind of interest is there and that we'll hold this in northern Minnesota in Cloquet area or Carlton area, potentially. So what they're looking for are people who have been in the past or are interested in the present to engage in learning what it might be to help serve or help with Alpha and then go to that training. So Marsha Nelson will be in the entryway following the service and she's right in the back, so raise your hand in case you don't know who she is. I don't know why you wouldn't, but... That's the lady you're going to talk to if you're interested in attending uh, the training. Now, we don't know when it's going to be yet because they're still trying to find out if there's an interest for it. But sometime in March, early in March, is what they're hoping for. And so uh, please talk to her if you're interested in Alpha and helping with Alpha. Alpha is a great tool of kind of a non-threatening way, providing a meal, having people sit down, let them hear about Jesus Christ or about the scriptures or those kind of things and then decide for themselves is this something that they might want to be a part of or to answer or even um, even raise objections in a very uh, an environment that allows that for to happen so what we're doing is introducing Jesus and letting Jesus this Holy Spirit bring the conviction rather than us telling them the answers and that happens during Alpha so I appreciate very much if you can investigate that and find out more about that if you're not familiar with it, with Marsha. The other announcements in your bulletin, there's, they're there. I'll just mention to you that uh, the annual meeting, if you are a chairperson of a committee or a department and you don't have your annual report finished yet, you have one week. We need to get that into the office because it takes quite a while to compile all those and put it into that booklet that we give to you to read prior to the annual meeting. So if you're not done yet, please finish that up this week. Also, divorce care has begun. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do this week is I'm attending a, a meeting with a couple of our district office officials um, talking about how we can reach people better here in the Hibbing area and what can we do to, uh, to uh, reach out and do that. They sent me a bunch of uh, study material that talks about what it's like in our Hibbing five mile radius and also in the region of five five seven four six what are people looking for what are what are they desiring in life what's the social economic structure and all that kind of stuff one thing that stood out is that we have a large population of divorced people that are not knowing what to do with that and so they're looking for help divorce care is one of those ways in which we can help so um, it's have started if you know someone that's divorced invite them to uh, to attend uh, and tell them this is something where there are a lot of people who are going through the same stuff you are can find some answers for their future. And so uh, that's, that's now ongoing. Church security seminar is coming up. Uh, just to let you know, we probably have 50 people signed up for that right now. Um, half dozen of those are from our church. The rest are all from churches across the Iron Range. And so uh, if you're interested in just knowing about that, you don't have to commit to anything, but you want to know about security 
issues within the church um, and biblical answers to that as well as practical answers in, in terms of what can you do to prevent tragedy from happening in your own congregation that I encourage you to come. It's on uh, the end of this month, January 27th. Thank you. I don't have my classes on, so thanks for coming in. Uh, other announcements in your bulletin. Uh, please read those ushers. Will you come forward, please? Oh, one other thing. This is an outreach. As you come forward, ushers, um, the other thing that stood out in that report is that what people are looking for, the number one thing they are looking for from a church is recreation. Weird, sounds weird to me, but that's the highest thing that people look for when they go to a church. And on the 28th of January, which is a Sunday afternoon, uh, we will be having a sledding party at Veterans Park just across the highway here. And uh, there'll be food provided and that kind of thing. Great way to meet your community in a very non threatening way. So plan to be there uh, if you can and just talk to people when you're there, not just people you know, but community members. Invite them to come over and get hot dogs, whatever are being provided. This is one way in which we can be very practical in building relationships with people so that we might have a chance later on to introduce them to Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so very, very much for our salvation. Thank you, God, that when we go through life issues that are tough, you are there. When we go through things that are seen to be a breeze, you are there. <coughs> you are always present, Lord. Always. So God, I just pray we will experience your presence this morning. Be glorified in our worship. And speak to us about what we need to hear, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A men's quartet plus two. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, the words are going to be up there, but we're going to ask you, and I know this is going to be tough for you, but we're going to ask you to not sing. Because we're going to do this a cappella, and if you start singing and get really loud, it's going to mess us up. So, so just like Elmer Fudd would say, be very, very quiet if you sing. Okay. How firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than you you he hath said? I'll never know that. 
going to continue our study on the story. I hope you have been keeping up, at least with the white book that says the story. Now that is taking portions of scripture for our purposes, but if you truly want to see the whole story, then read uh, the fill in the blanks with First and Second Kings and some of the prophets that we're going to be getting into. So as a review, we are on an adventure because we are trying to figure out from our perspective, our lower story, God's perspective, his upper story. God made us to love him, to have relationship with him, and we threw that out the window through rebellion, and that rebellion is called sin. And so now this Bible that we are reading, the story that we are going through, is seeing how throughout all of human history, God is orchestrating to reconcile humanity back to him, to give us a chance for salvation from our sins and restoration and relationship with him. Since our first message of the story, we have seen mankind push God away rather than embrace him. God creates a nation of Israel to begin the process of bringing out the Messiah to all humanity. But instead of that going the way God wants it to go, mankind continues to push God away. And the 12 tribes become divided among themselves. And 10 of those tribes go to the north. And they're called the northern tribes, or the tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom. Two of those tribes are in the south, and they're called the southern tribe, or the tribe of Judah. The hope of redemption and reconciliation of God lies with Judah because God has made a promise to David, who was king of Judah, that the Messiah would come through them. But today we learn that the northern tribe, Israel, is down and Judah is next. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we we look from a distance historically and even as a people group about the history of Israel and its relationship with you and its relationship with others in that area of the world. We can be very um, untouched, insensitive, even judgmental about how they acted. And yet, Lord, their story carries with it an example of what we need to be alert to or we may fall into the same trap. So I just pray you will give us clarity, help us to understand, Lord, as we look at it from a human lower story perspective, help us to really be able to embrace that there is a larger story playing out here of God's love, God's mercy, and God's judgment, and God's reconciliation give us understanding in that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin with the bad news, Israel's demise. In 2 Kings verse, or chapter 17, beginning with verse 1 and 3, and then jumping around a little bit, it says, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea, the son of Elah, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned nine years. Again, I just want you to remember the terminology. Israel is the northern kingdom and Judah is the southern kingdom. So when I'm talking about Israel, I'm not talking about all 12 tribes at this point. I'm talking about the northern kingdom. 
And uh, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, not only as the king of Israel, who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile to Assyria, and then settled them in Hala and Haber, on the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Now this came about because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations from whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel, and in the customs of the kings of Israel, which they had introduced. So the sons of Israel did things secretly, which were not right against the Lord their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set for themselves sacred pillars and ashram on every hillside and every green tree. And there they burned incense in all the high places, as the nations did, which the Lord had carried away to exile before them. And they did evil things, provoking the Lord. They served idols concerning which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. However, they did not listen but stiffened their necks like their fathers, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenant, which he made with their fathers, and warnings which, which he warned them. And they followed vanity and became vain, and went after the nations which surrounded them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. They forsook all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made for themselves molten images, even two calves, and made an Asherah, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. Then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire, and practiced divination and enchantments, sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel, and removed them from his sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. This morning, I visited with the teens, the Sunday school class. And one of the things I had mentioned to them was, as I grew in my relationship with God and also grow in my understanding of Scripture as a pastor, one of the questions I always asked is, where's the lineage back to the different tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel? Why isn't there, there, there more evidence of who came from what tribe? And this is the reason why, right here. Because Israel, ten of those tribes, decided that they would worship God in a fashion that was more comfortable to them. So they took pieces of Judaism and melted it in with pieces of, basically, Satanism, Baal worship. They began to create images and idols, and they began sacrificing their own children. And they went through all this stuff of blending together religiosity rather than staying focused on what God told them way back when Moses was given the law by God. And we read, So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. And none was left except the tribe of Judah, which consisted of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Israel rejects God even when captured. It has been up to this point. Israel rebels. God um, elicits punishment, basically, judgment. They realize we've really messed up, and then they come back to God. But now Israel is, they're, they're dispersed. The king of Assyria moves them to different parts so they can't gather together and retaliate. But even while they're in captivity, even while they have been defeated and displaced, they still decide that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not good enough for them. So God wants to wake them up again. So while they're in captivity, God gives them another chance with a lion 
plague, L-I-O-N. It says in chapter 17, verse 25, at the beginning of their living there, they did not fear the Lord, therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. Now, that just doesn't happen every day. Where all of a sudden you're walking down through the streets and a lion pops out and kills someone and eats them. This was a judgment from God to wake them up to say, you still have an opportunity here. The Assyrian king. Now the Assyrian king is totally against God of Israel. The Assyrian king decides he wants to stop the plague, so he sends in a Hebrew priest. It says in verse 27 of chapter 17, Take there one of the priests whom you carried away into exile, and let him go and live there. And let him teach them the custom of the God of the land. Other words, I recognize this is unusual. And something's happening here that's not normal for us. And so to stop this from happening, send in one of their priests and let him teach them about their God so that they will be spared. This is an ungodly king. But it did no good. The conquerors didn't see the light. Verse 29, or verse 29 of the same chapter, it says, But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in houses of the high places which the people of Samaria had made. Every nation in their cities in which they lived. The men of Babylon made Sukkoth Benoth. The men of Kuth made Nergal. The men of Hamath made Ashima. And the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak. And the Sepharites burned their children in the fire of Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sephavarim. They also feared the Lord and appointed from among them priests of the high places who acted for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods according to the custom of the nations from among whom they had been carried away into exile. They basically were violating the first few commandments that God had given them. You shall love the Lord your God and Him only. You shall not make any graven images. Here it says they serve the Lord, they love the Lord, but they also had all these other things going on. God said it doesn't work that way. And so God allowed them to go into captivity. When they went into captivity, instead of listening to the judgment of God, they fully embraced the religious process of those nations that took them into captivity. And they disappeared. The ten tribes no longer, they never recovered. And they were simulated into their captors. And then there's Judah. Once the Assyrian king had defeated the ten tribes of Israel, now he's going to, face, now he's going to go down and take Judah. But here's Judah's deliverance. And that is the, our hero, Hezekiah. In chapter 18, verse 1 of 2 Kings, it says, Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the son of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Neshetan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. This was their salvation, is they had glimmers of hope in Judah of godly kings, and this was one of them. Just to clarify, if you're not familiar with the story, when Moses was leading the people of Israel, at one point a plague came to the people of Israel, and they were getting sick, by bitten by snakes, and 
God instructed Moses to raise up a pole and put uh, um, a snake on it, and then they would go to that and they would receive healing from God. Well, they never tore it down. And so when they didn't tear it down, then the people started going there and they started worshiping the pole because it had some miraculous history to it. And so Hezekiah says, this ain't happening. Not my kingdom. And he tore that down, even though it had some very historical significance to those people. Because he wanted everybody to worship God and God alone. So that's the hero. So then, who's the villain? The villain is Sennacherib. Now, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. Say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is this confidence that you have? Okay, let's stop, all right? So he's just defeated the people of Israel. They have been, they love the Lord along with everybody else that was out there. And they were defeated by Assyria. So now Assyria comes down to Judah and he's thinking these are the same people connected to those people. So he says, why do you have this confidence? So he even tries to entice them. He says, you say that they are only empty words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? Now behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, as which, if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. In other words, you're looking for a, a coalition with the people of Egypt to save you. At least that's how he was looking at it. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not that same person whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has torn down? And he said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before his altar in Jerusalem. This king from Assyria is looking at this from a very practical standpoint. He said, the God that you say is going to save you, your king has just torn down all those altars. He's disgracing the king. And the reality, he didn't understand why Hezekiah chose to take down those high places. Now therefore, he says, come and make a bargain with master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses, if you're able to, on your part, to set riders on them. How then can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servant and then rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Do you hear him mocking that? I didn't need the Lord's approval. Matter of fact, he told me to come here and take you out. But rather than going to war, I'll give you a few horses and we'll make it a done deal. You just worship me. That was the bargain. Now, if you were a soldier or you were a citizen of Judah, you might be thinking twice about, well, they just took out our ten tribes and we only have two left. So what does Hezekiah the king do? He prays for deliverance. And when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and entered the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household with Shebna, the scribe and the elders of the priests, and covered with sackcloth, and to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, rebuke and rejection. For children have come to birth and there is no strength to deliver. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear all the words of Rapshakah, whom his master the king of Assyria has sent to reproach the living God and rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore offer a, pray, a prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of the king Hezekiah came to Isaiah and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid, because the, Lord, the words that you have heard, which the servant of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me, behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own hand. <coughs> Excuse me. So Hezekiah hears this, and says, 
Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood, and stone. So they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord our God, I pray, deliver us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Okay? Simple prayer. He goes and he laments. He goes into mourning. And he gets his elders to go into mourning. They go to the prophet Isaiah to get some instructions. And then Hezekiah takes it upon himself at this point. After getting all this done, he goes to God and says, Lord, they've destroyed the ten tribes because they said they have destroyed the God of Israel. And the reality is it's because those people, they, they, they had already sealed their own doom by, uh, by rebelling against you. But now they think that we're the same as them. And they need to know that you truly are the only God in the world. And so we pray that you will give us deliverance to proclaim your holiness and who you are. And God gave an angelic answer in chapter 19. Verse 34, For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the camp woke up, behold, they were all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach, his god, that Adramelech and Shadrazer killed him with the sword and they escaped into the land of Erat. And Eshar Haddon, his son, became king in his place. You see what happened in that answer to prayer? The swiftness of God's judgment and declaration? While they were sleeping, camped on the... Uh, actually, they had already gotten into the territory of Judah. An angel goes through at night and kills a hundred... 85,000 soldiers. I can't even, that's hard for us to comprehend. Population of Duluth is about 80,000. So figure the Northland is wiped out of all population. That's about the amount of people we're talking about. And the king wakes up and realizes this is not good. We're out of here. And they leave. And then here's the interesting thing. Is then he goes to Nineveh and he goes to worship his false god. And while he's in worshiping his false god, his own people rise up against him and kill him. His god couldn't save him. Didn't even give him a clue. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is proclaimed to be the one and only true God in all the world, all the universe. But Judah is filled with a bunch of normal people, just like you and I. And this is where we have to now apply it to our own lives. Look what happens after this. Judah, brace for impact. Because you're not the shining jewel that never fails. Because some people never learn. In chapter 21, we read this. Manasseh, Hezekiah's son, was 12 years old when he became king. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephshibah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. He brought it all back again. So now Judah's living in this syncretistic, 
vile rebellion against God. Worshipping both God and many other gods as though they're all equal. And enter God's prophet Isaiah. He proclaims this in the lower story. In the midst of this rebellious nature and action. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder. Chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. This is Isaiah, living among the people of Judah. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. And then he's given the message to tell the people. And the message for the people is not that great. Basically, in a nutshell, in chapters 13 and 14, he says, You will be defeated and destroyed, and only a remnant will remain, like a stump of a tree that has been cut down. Prophecies regarding Babylon and Judah's 70 years of captivity are proclaimed. The Assyrians are the enemy. They think this is the group that God has defeated. We're in good shape. It isn't the Assyrians that are going to capture you. It's going to be the Babylonians. The message isn't good for Judah. You're going down. But God's promise to David is that you will one day be restored. The upper story, God promises restoration of Judah, but more importantly, redemption of humanity. In Isaiah 29, we have these recorded in verse 6 and 7. He says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see and arise. Princesses will also bow down because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The world's going to recognize. The people are going to see God will fulfill His promise. And while proclaiming Judah's freedom from captivity after the 70 years, Isaiah is giving prophecy then of mankind's freedom from sin with the coming Messiah that will happen in years yet to come. In Isaiah 53, we read these awesome words. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, of man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hid their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, 
and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased. Bear very much what God is saying here about our relationship with him. Because it says the Lord was pleased to crush him. And if you haven't picked it up yet, we're talking about the Messiah Jesus. Putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Folks, we can look back at this and go, oh, that's great stuff. Because we know Jesus has arrived. We know he's been put to death and resurrected from the dead, provides salvation for all mankind. These folks, they haven't even gone to captivity yet. And God's saying, this is a lot to happen yet. There's a lot going on here. Judah, you're going to go into captivity. Then you're going to be released. And then there's going to be a bunch of other stuff that happens. We're going to, we still have to talk about Daniel. We've got to talk about a lot of stuff yet. God's upper story is, I'm giving you a glimpse of hope for your lives. We don't have to keep doing what the people of the northern kingdom kept doing, and even the southern kingdom to a point where we go and we start to say, God, I love you, but there's other things I love too. And so we'll just kind of bring it together. God says, no, you don't bring it together. You love me and you follow me. There's only one way to do this. But if you follow me, there will be redemption for your sin. There will be everlasting forgiveness and a reconciliation with God for all eternity if you follow my plan. We see more and more of the coming together of the lower story with the upper story. It's getting more and more exciting because right now it's like, oh, Easter's on the way. Easter's coming, okay? By the way, we have to go back to the Nativity before we get to Easter. So just bear in mind as we follow the chronological order, okay? But this is great stuff. But it's not just stuff. It's truth. It's God orchestrating humanity's existence for His glory and to reconcile ourselves, us, back to Him. He wants us to be delivered. He wants us to be reconciled. He gives His only begotten Son, Jesus, to die for us, just as Isaiah said He would. But there's still lessons to be learned from God's people before we get to that upper story plan and its, fully, and its full revelation as we go through the Scriptures. So what does all this have to do with us today? Right here. The lesson today is that God is patient with us. But he is intolerant of sin. We can walk in God's grace and blessing and receive all that God has for us if we are consistent in our faithfulness to God. Woven with prayer produces growth. Consistent faithfulness to God, woven with prayer, produces growth, protection, 
and deliverance that lasts. But just like the people of Israel, there has to be the consistency. We can say all we want that we recognize that God is the God of the universe and Jesus is the Son of God and He brings salvation. But knowing that and applying it to our everyday life, that's the tipping of the scales. God says, I do not want you to love anything else except me. There should be no other God before me. And we may not have graven images. We may not have molten calves. But we might have children or grandchildren or spouses or money or jobs or careers or, or hobbies or boats or whatever that we cherish quite a lot. And God, when I have to make a decision, I put that on, can I do that and still love you? And God's not saying you can't, we can't have those things, but what God's saying is that if any of those things distract from me, then it has become a God in your life, and you need to decide who you're going to serve. Because that will bring retribution with God. God loves us too much to just let us go off and do our own thing. And if that's not enough, the Bible promises that for all people, there's going to be judgment once Jesus returns. For those that are believers, it's called the judgment seat of Christ, where we go through and those things that maybe we never yielded to God would be revealed, and now we've got to deal with that. And I don't know what that all is going to take place, but God does not honor sin and rebellion. And for those that never prayed to receive Jesus, it's a great white throne judgment. And that's when God looks at the soul of each person. And if that person has never surrendered themselves to Christ and dealt with that sin issue we're born with, then God says at that point, depart from me. I never knew you and your eternity is forever separated from God in hell. So we have the joy of salvation while here on earth, but also the responsibility and joy of consistent relationship with God as we live out our faith. Let's pray. Worship team, will you come? Lord, uh, th- th- these stories, we can sometimes look at them as though we are, di- we are distant from them or they don't affect us, but they do because it's, it's your stories. It's your relationship with humanity. It's your plan to bring salvation to all human beings. But the finality of whether or not we accept that is really up to us. Do we want to embrace salvation by confessing our sins and surrendering to you, Jesus, as Savior? Do we want to remain faithful in that relationship by allowing you to be the Lord and Master of our life? Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to, again, evaluate us, even now. We can look over at the northern tribe of Israel and say, wow, you guys really messed up. But, Lord, that could be us if we're not careful. So help us, Father, by your Holy Spirit, reveal to us in our minds anything that maybe we are allowing to be our God or try to syncretismly speaking put that in equalness with you. Something as profound as money, maybe, or maybe something, Lord, as practical as time. But God, help us to know what that might be if it's there, and to surrender to you and follow you consistently with prayer according to your plan. I pray in Jesus' name.
say that with me now. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. One more time. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We pray, Lord, now that you go with us, keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. 